Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for the second lecture in the Considering Collecting series. This series would not be possible without the generous support of Lawrence C. Zale Associates Inc, a visual arts advisory company. My name is Leila and I head up the research forum team here at the portal. And for those who attended our first event in this series, you will already know that it aims to explore collecting from different perspectives, lifting the lid and revealing the behind the scenes world of the art market. Tonight, we are asking how can a digital space help our sector overcome new challenges within the art market? And with the COVID-19 lockdowns and increasing awareness of the impact of global travel on the environment, we are all looking for new ways to buy, sell and access artworks. Now, online digital spaces, including virtual and augmented reality platforms, provide a potential addition to the physical gallery space where collectors from around the world can view works and learn more about them without leaving the comfort of their homes. So I am now delighted to introduce you all to Oliver Miro. Oliver is co-founder of Vortic, an art-led platform that aims to create a connected, collaborative conversation around immersive 3D, augmented reality and virtual reality exhibitions from the world's leading galleries and institutions. Oliver started this process when he became acutely conscious the art world lacked a truly high quality way of presenting artworks digitally that would be engaging enough to captivate collectors, inspire artists, and help move galleries and institutions towards a more sustainable future. So throughout the next hour, we will explore the realization of Vortec, as well as how galleries across the world have used it to respond to an ever-changing real world situation, and also what its potential is for the future in shaping the art mark market going forward. And before I hand over to Oliver, I wanted to do just a little quick bit of housekeeping. So I'm going to ask you all to put your questions you have for Oliver into the chat, which you can see at the bottom of your screen, and I will get to as many of them as possible. Okay, so that's enough from me. You'll all be glad to know. Oliver, I will hand over to you to get started, and we'll get your slides up as well. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Fantastic. So first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to speak. Um, it's really been a, a journey the last five years, and I wanted to really introduce everyone to a platform that people may or may not have seen already. Um, it has really been um, something relatively unexpected that has come about for me in the last five years starting a tech business and it's been full of challenges and sort of finding out incredible things there was so much um sort of respect now that i have for the tech industry um now i've seen what goes in to shaping platforms and building building something that everybody can use so this um, talk will be split really into four main areas. First of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about the landscape um, pre-pandemic where and, and how the idea for Vortic evolved. And then looking at how we built Vortic um, and so the, some of the journey that we had um, in terms of from the tech side, but also why we took some decisions that we did and then going through the launch, how we launched the product, growing the product over the last 18 months. And again, some of the challenges we faced there and then looking ahead to the future. Um, so as a starting point, um, got to get over talking to the screen here. It's, it's, uh, it's a little unnerving, but so going back to 2016, and this is really um, where the, the Vortic journey started. And it was, um, it was really a, a, an incredible year of these, all these events happening. I think it, it seems a long time ago now, but it was the year of Brexit. It was the year of um, Trump being voted in as president. And there were also some incredible shows. The, the, the year started off um, with the show Big Bang Data at Somerset House, which was really got me thinking about the digital and um and from there i was on a personal level going through this transitional period where we were expecting our second child um and i 
started to think, and I've had the same experience with my first child, is that I started to think about the world that we were bringing our children into or that they were being born into. Um, and, oh, oh, there's a little buzzing. I hope everyone can still hear me. Um, so it was um, this moment for me where we were really doing uh, at the gallery so many art fairs every year. We were at that point, I'm um, doing around 14 art fairs a year. And um, it was sort of almost like a, a, an ongoing circus that we were all doing. It was, uh, you'd get back to, the, to, to London and you'd start preparing for the next fair. And it was once a month and we'd be going away. Um, and when you would arrive at the fairs, you would see um, just the, the vast numbers of crates and packaging that, and this, in, this huge amount of artworks that were shipped in around the world from all these different places around the world into, into the art fair. And of course, a, you know, a lot of the time it was one fair out of many fairs in that city happening that week. So that you would always do a fair with, you know, three or four satellite fairs around you. So when you start to think about how much artwork was being shipped into the city each week, it was almost unthinkable. Um, and what really surprised me is that we would see so many images of the, of the works before we got to the fair. And when we turned up at the fair, the works were completely different to how I had envisaged them or the team had envisaged them. We always were having the same conversation as, oh my goodness, I can't believe how this work looks from the images that um, we've seen already. So my mind sort of shifted in terms of, okay, how, how can we move towards a more sustainable model going forward for initially my thinking was for the gallery that I worked in. Um, and what I quickly realized was that there was not really any way of, um, of, of digitally showing an artwork which did justice to the artist that we represent. And it's a really fundamental um, part of a gallery's sort of operate, operations is the way that we represent our artists and the way that our artists are shown both physically and digitally. So um, really there was no tools that we had to be able to, to use. There was a couple of sort of um, technologies really in their infancy. One of them, these Google um, style um, street cameras where it would you know, guide you through the street and you could sort of jump from area to area. And they, they started using it in the galleries, but there was just no way of really looking at an, at a, an artwork in that way um, or with any real quality. Um, and then there was this, this sort of the start of using these um, game engines, which were in existence, but they were turning the sort of the journey into a gallery more into the feel of a computer game. And it really wasn't bespoke or made, made for art in any way. Um, and the other thing which really upset me after working in the gallery for the, the, the decade before is that I would see how much work would go into creating these incredible exhibitions. And every team from, you know, from the very beginning when you would visit the artist in the studio and you'd go through the whole journey of putting on an exhibition at the gallery you would see um, just the incredible amount of work that would go into it. And the show would be up and you'd have the opening. It was fantastic. But after three or four weeks, the show would come down and you were really just left with a few installation views, which really for the amount of work that had got into the exhibition, just, it didn't seem right somehow that, um, you know, it was just really just the memories. Um, and at the same time, I remember having sort of incredible conversations about all these shows in the past and thinking, how nice would it be to be able to walk through some of these exhibitions that we've had on in the last 10 years or so, going back even further. Um, 
So our mission became very, very clear um, when Vorset was founded, and it was really to create the best digital experience, um, really to do justice for all the artists that are showing work online. And one, uh, the, the sort of the Christmas of that year, I was walking through a department store and um, a lady kindly sort of called me over and said, I've got something really great to show you. Um, and just put this on your head. And it was a VR headset. It was the first time that I'd ever experienced VR. And I put the headset on and there was these dinosaurs and they were jumping out at me. And it was, it, it was great. It was a really great experience, but I left that experience with thinking, well, it was cool, but I don't really know what I could do with that. Um, and, you know, it, it took me a while. Um, and over that, that break at that Christmas, I really started thinking actually, this could be an incredible way to bring people and placing them in front of an artwork and really being able to spend time with that work. And I, yeah, it was really at that moment that I decided, okay, this, let, let's find a way to, to build um, this platform in VR. So it was really, for me, a really exciting um, technology and, um, I set about building it without any experience of the tech, the tech world um, at all. So the first point of call were a couple of friends of mine who I had worked with in a past life um, in finance. So after I graduated, I worked in finance for a decade. Um, and one of my friends had gone off to work in tech and I, we, we called, I called him up and I said, I've got this great idea. How can we go about it? And so we met and we, we went through a few ideas and we really spent the first six months um, researching and talking to different agencies and different people within that industry. And um, during my research, I, I, I started reading about um, a woman at Google who had started their VR side in, in the film side and she was really, Sort of portrayed in this article I was reading about, you know, as one of the great minds of the VR industry. So um, I very sort of, uh, it was a little bit of a crazy idea, but I thought, why not? I'm just going to email her and see if she replies. And literally within an hour of emailing her, um, she replied and said, Oh, I'd love to meet you. It sounds like a really great idea that you have. Why don't you come over to Paris to meet me? Um, her name was Jessica Bruhart and we, I went to Paris, met with her and as soon as I met her, I knew that she was really a key person in guiding us through those initial stages of building the platform. And she was then able to introduce me to so many of these incredible developers who she had worked with in the VR area. And it took time to meet exactly the, the, the right developers with the, the shared vision and trying to get the vision across to developers who are traditionally not coming from an art world background. They were very much about the pure technology. Um, so as we started to build the product, it was really um, at that point, as it was you know, being built that I realized how enormous, like the enormity of the vision that we had for this. Um, it was really a way of creating a, a platform that everybody could use and was easy to use and could be used by everyone in the art world to create content that would really be, you know, a, a way of showing and working with the artists or with the artworks that they work with and, and showing those in the best possible way. So instead of building a, a, using a game engine, which some of the developers that we met wanted to do, and they said, oh, this would be easy, we can use this game engine. Everything that was produced in a game engine felt like a game in many, many ways. Um, so it was at that point that we made that decision to really build our own engine and not use so much of a game engine to get rid of that, that game feel, which really sort of, prolonged the development period for the product. So we then spent the best part of 
three, three and a half years building this. And we went through so many different versions of it. Um, and it was only really at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, that we felt that we had a, a, a product where someone that we could give to an artist and say, look at your artwork in here and, and tell me what you think. So it was quite interesting building this from the gallery perspective, because I really had this, you know, really understood the sensitivities of what artists felt. And I, you know, I, we, I work with many, many artists and I always look at images with them and I always know what they're upset about and how the work doesn't translate well digitally. Um, and at the same time, we, we built something that I knew the galleries would find useful because everything that we were missing in terms of tools, I would want to put into the platform. So it was really when we, when we started looking, I had so much functionality that we wanted to build. And the developers said, if we were to build all of this functionality, we'd be building this for probably 20 years. So it was really a, um, a question of scaling back and trying to get the fundamentals in. And then as the, the platform grows, we were able to um, keep building and building and adding, adding functionality. So that really took us to um, early 2020 and or well, late 2019. And late 2019, I was very confident with the, with the platform and the way that it looked in VR. So we started planning the launch of this. And um, we then um, started to have conversations with some of the galleries that um, we share many, many artists with, because I'd shown this in the, in the previous six months to some of the artists and they started to get quite excited about the possibilities. So 2019 at Freeze London, we did a project um, with Grayson Perry, which was never publicly shown, but we had it at the gallery and we, sh we were showing it. And there was so much excitement around it. And so we took this, some of the excitement from the other galleries and the artists, and we decided that we would launch in Hong Kong in March, 2020. So the plans were underway and everything was great. We had everything in order. And then the talk of the pandemic started um, picking up, and especially in Asia. So by late January um, 2020, a lot of the team members were starting to get a little bit panicked about having to go to Hong Kong um, two months later. So at that point, it was very much, it was felt that the, the pandemic was very much limited to the Asian region, although we know now that it wasn't. But at that point, um, the Hong Kong fair was canceled. And um, we were left in this really awkward position because not only was the fair cancelled, but all of the VR headsets um, that our product relied on um, were made in China and the headsets came to a complete standstill. We couldn't get a headset delivered to us and we started to have to rethink the launch. So, we then decided um, between Victoria Mira and David Sferno, the two galleries launching, that um, we would show the VR headsets in all of our gallery spaces around the world. So we had our spaces in London, in Venice, and in New York, and David Sferno in Paris, in Hong Kong, in New York as well. So we, we had this great plan to, to launch um, in, at the same time as Hong Kong, but in the gallery spaces. And then of course, um, all our plans were thrown into disarray when the gallery spaces were unimaginably closed. And we went back to the drawing board and um, I really knew at that point that outside of the, um, the VR platform with the VR headsets, all we had was a mobile app at that point. So we decided that we would launch this on the mobile app, which of course had all sorts of challenges around it. Um, 
the, the fact it was a mobile app, it just wasn't very accessible. But we decided to do it anyway, because we thought the technology was really, really needed at that point in time. So we launched um, in May 2020, um, and I actually launched this from, um, I was at that point in um, the middle of the countryside. I'd escaped from London at the beginning of March, and I was in the middle of the countryside with very limited internet. So it was this incredibly um, stressful launch that we had on the side by side. And this is a little video here um, of the uh, two of the works that were in the exhibition. So the concept was is that um, there were two works by each of the artists that we co-represent, um, plus one artist that David Swerner had chosen from our program and one artist, in that case, it was Grayson Perry, and we had chosen an artist, Franz Vest, from David's program. And we were showing the work side by side, but it was also this um, sort of feeling of collaboration. It was Victoria Mirror and David Swerner side by side as well, because we had this, you know, this very close relationship with, with all of the artists that we co-represent. And when the pandemic came about after this side by side, I think the first thing that I noticed was the sense of community in the art world coming together. And there was this um, WhatsApp group that was formed um, by Sadie Coles very early on in the pandemic, which um, she added all of the British galleries together onto a WhatsApp group so we could all talk. And it was just this, this incredible feeling of community, which outside of the art fairs hadn't really existed before, or it was, wasn't really something that I had witnessed. And it was this coming together. And I thought, well, look, we have this great technology. The, the talk on the WhatsApp group was very much about how we could bring London back to the world and how we could, the galleries could continue operating throughout this period. And I sort of, you know, I said, look, I've got this technology and everyone would be more than welcome to use it. It's very much in its infancy and it is, um, it, it's, it's quite stable. It's not completely stable, but as long as you understand that, I think it could be a really great way to sort of allow people that journey into London, that feeling of walking around galleries. Um, and that's really when the, the London Collective was born. Um, and we just had the most incredible response. This, this shows a little list of all of the galleries here that signed up for the very first version of the London Collective. So it really was from the, the, the very large galleries all the way down to the, the smaller galleries. Um, and everyone felt a part of it. And there was a committee that was formed um, to really take everyone's views into account. So it was again, following on from this, this community that had formed. And um, so we launched the London Collective and there were, I think in the end around 40 galleries here that posted an exhibition and some loved it so much that they were posting exhibition after exhibition after exhibition which was fantastic and that lasted uh, we, we kept that running really until June 2020 which was when the first wave of the pandemic and everyone thought oh great it's all over now um, and we kept it going until then and then as we were doing um, as we were doing the, the London Collective, as it was coming to an end, we had a call from, um, from Outset and they asked us, they said, look, we, we have, you know, the, it's not only the commercial galleries that have, you know, this need for your platform, but it's also the museums. The museums are really missing their visitors. And we'd love to be able to offer your technology to the museums. And I said, well, look, it, it really matches up with my vision for the platform, but it's not really ready yet. You know, like everything had moved so, so quickly from launching with two galleries to suddenly having 60 or 70 galleries come on in the first couple of months. It was, we were a small little team 
and we were dealing with like this monumental demand for for the for the platform um so i said look i'd love to take this pro project on because they had come and come to me and said uh, the, the project is all about reviving the archive so it's taking back the audience back into exhibitions which have existed in the past so um when I was building this, I always had this um, incredible show in my mind that I really had always wished that I could walk through, which was this show of um, women artists from 1500 to 1950, um, which was at LACMA in 1976. And I always thought about that show in terms of how I could recreate that one day. And it's one of the beauties of the product when we were building it is you start to realize, oh my goodness, like we could recreate shows, we could plan shows, like there's, there's no limits once this technology is up and running. So Revive the Archive um, was formed and we had 15 British institutions, um, again, ranging from the, the very large institutions such as the Tate and the Hayward, down to the smaller institutions and more regional institutions like Spike Highland. Um, so we launched, after we'd launched the London Collective, we realized that Revive the Archive and for the museums, it really required more functionality. The museums wanted event systems, they wanted audio tours, and all of these things were built um, before the launch, which was at the very beginning of this year. Um, what we had noticed in the pandemic was that the, there'd been this seismic shift in the digital. Suddenly we were confronted by all of these unexpected happenings digitally. Um, Sotheby's, for example, came on and started showing galleries and showing artists represented by galleries and partnering with them, which was almost unthinkable um, before, but there was this real necessity for galleries to, to sell. So you were seeing the art fairs, they were coming on, you were putting five or six artworks online and you would think oh, this is a really bad way of showing our artists or representing our artists, but there was such a necessity for the majority of galleries to keep going and keep selling that they, they did it, they did it anyway. Even though they could see, okay, it's not very exciting, it's not, not the best way for us to be doing it, but there was this, this need um, to continue selling and platforms, um, other platforms were introducing sort of buy now, buy now technology where you could click and you could make your purchase. And I think we were in this position where we had to really, I had to make a decision, like we really stick to our guns here and continue with the vision that we have, which is to represent our artists in the best possible way and translate their work into the digital environment in a way that justifies the work that they're making. Um, the galleries, I mean, it took me by surprise as well. Galleries were giving up the control of the placement of their artists and their artworks, which is fundamental to the success of both artists and a gallery. And we were seeing this, this shift all around us, but the, the mission remained consistent, which is for me, I think one of the, the biggest decisions so far that we've had to make throughout the pandemic without transitioning to this purely um, sort of sales model. Um, and the other really interesting development, which I'm sure everyone is aware of is the, the, this demand for, for digital collectibles. So in the last few months, we've seen the whole boom of this NFT um, market, um, which for me presents many, many, many issues, um, but it's also completely fascinating. And there are so many aspects of that technology, which I like, and there's so many question marks hanging over my head about how it could actually work, the ease of which it can be manipulated, the problems around um, sort of transparency. So there's so many things that came up over that, um, that period. Um, for us, harnessing the technology um, really in the service of the artists and the artists and the arts remained consistent throughout. So that really took us up to 
today. Um, and over the last year, I think it's been very easy for us to sort of to think, okay, we're all really, really struggling. Um, businesses are completely struggling to, to stay afloat. But for me, one of the, the, the biggest issues with so many friends in the charitable sector was seeing the way that donations had dried up, and charities had dried up in terms of their funding. And I wanted to try and really help some of the charities that we were close with um, at the gallery and through the, through the arts. Um, so the first charitable project was launched last year, which was um, for Parlay for the Oceans, um, an ocean conservation charity. And again, it, we, I continued the sense of community and galleries coming together. So I think we had in the Parlay Collective around um, 16 galleries come on and show works in support of that charity. A, um, a proportion of all sales would go to the charity. And that was followed quite quickly by um, a human rights organization, um, Reprieve, and they came on and we did again this incredible collective um, for them. And it was really sort of um, incredibly successful for, for raising money during that period. And just recently in the last month or so, um, we launched the Out Collective on the platform. Um, 27 galleries, again, um, coming on for um, LGBTQ plus charities um, and gender issues. And I think this is like incredibly important um, area for us and for the platform going forward is this continuing support of the, 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 the charities, but from the art side. And it really offers a way for, for not only um, the galleries, the commercial galleries, but also for the museums to support and support the museums as well. So the great part of Revive the Archive was that the donations for everyone that visited any one of the exhibitions that were in a, a part of the collective, the donations were shared between all of the museums. So it was this really incredible way to try and support many of you know the smaller the smaller institutions that were really really struggling through this period, um, and that's not to say the larger organisations were not struggling as well because we know it has been really a, a struggle for 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 all sides of the museums. Um, so that really brings us to today. Um, we are just launching our 4,000th exhibition um, on the Vortic platform that has been curated. So that is a combination of public exhibitions and private exhibitions and private views. And I think that is um, you know, a, a really strong part of the Vortic platform is that everything that we create or is created using the platform is completely flexible in how it's viewed. So it can be used across so many spheres. It can be used for planning exhibitions, sharing that with curators, sharing it with museums, sharing it with artists, but also sharing it with um, collectors and allowing them sort of private views of, of, of artworks without having to sort of, there's a lot of sensitivity around some artworks and artists wanting that work to be seen. So it really offers everything that we're able to um, digitally. Um, and then we are on the launch, on the really on the eve now of our launch in VR. So for me, the platform, as I've explained, it was always built for the headset technology. And I think for me, I see the first 18 months of the platform as if, you know, it was almost like a soft launch. And the full launch comes when we have the VR technology um, and are able to distribute it. So this area is making incredible sort of strides quite quickly. It's a little bit like when the very first iPhones came out. So from the first iPhone to the next version of it, the jumps were massive in what they could do. And we're seeing the same now with the VR technology. So it's still very much in its infancy. And every headset that is launched there's a massive leap in quality and we are targeting what we, we have it, the, the, 
the platform targeted for the Oculus Quest 2, um, but we're very sort of, um, well, we're anticipating the launch of an Oculus, a, a somewhat higher um, spec headset, um, which should be, we're all hoping will be announced later this week on Thursday. Um, but we're not, no one's quite sure yet. Um, but we're also really exciting, in a really exciting position with the museums that we're working with. So we're on the, the sort of precipice of launching three really major museums who are coming onto the platform over the next couple of months. Um, and I think we're working at the moment with 180 galleries and 30 or so museums and institutions. And the platform has really come a long way um, over the past 18 months. So the quality of what we're able to, to produce just gets better and better and better. And it's really the, I, I suppose, because the focus is all about the quality, it's something that we can, we really focus on from the tech side. So we're not so focused on the, the marketing and sales side. It's all about how can we keep continuing to push the quality? And I think this video gives a little bit of an example um, from the Kasama show that we had at the gallery, which we then um, showed on the Vortic platform earlier this summer. And we, we introduced, which I was really excited about. I don't know if, if everyone will notice, but the, um, the floors and the reflections of the floors, because it just gives everything that feeling of reality. And when you're in, the space and everything is moving around you how it would in real life it just really gives you that sense of being in the exhibition and being able to walk around it and that feeling that you're there together um we've we've started scanning many many gallery spaces so from commercial galleries to museum spaces and again this is another example here of the quality of the the scanning of artworks. It just, um, for, for me, I just keep being more and more surprised at how fantastic the quality is. And first of all, ca capturing geometry and scale, but then in terms of the color reproduction, unfortunately showing it on Zoom is not the best way, um, but in terms of capturing a material and the way that light works with that material is really for me like, it just keeps improving and improving because our focus is so strongly on that. Um, so we have this really beautiful system now to plan exhibitions, to create exhibitions, to recreate exhibitions. And something that we hope in the, over the course of the next year, everybody will be able to work with. And this just a little bit of, sorry, one more slide is, um, this is an exhibition, our latest museum launch on the platform was CAC Malaga in this incredible museum. I'm not sure how many of you have been there, but it, it's this phenomenal building um, with these incredibly high ceilings. And we were able to capture this and recreate um, a Jules de Valencourt exhibition, which was at the museum. And it really, for me, is like one of the beauties of the, the, this product or the platform is that you're able to spend as much time in this museum with the artworks that you choose really in your own time. There's no one pushing you out of the way saying, oh, I want to see this. It really allows the audience really to spend time in their own time, whenever, whatever time of day with these really incredible sort of masterpieces that all of the museums coming on will be showing. Um, and for me, um, that really is one of the, the key areas that I, I really love about Vortic, but the VR side is, we're on the launch here of, of launching something very special in terms of a community. So I think for me, one of the, the biggest hurdles to overcome is we, we have this incredible technology, but it's a very solitary experience when you go onto the Vortic platform at the moment. So you go on, you see your exhibition and it's fantastic and you can spend time with the artworks. You can see those artworks in beautiful detail. But I think what it's missing is that sense of sharing that with somebody else. And that's really what is being introduced over the next few months and especially with the VR technology. So the VR technology that we've built is completely social. So you can curate an exhibition or you can go into an exhibition and, and meet in a lobby where there's 
huge amounts of exhibitions to go and see with friends and you can walk around the exhibitions together. You can do guided tours, artists can do guided tours um, in the exhibition. I think avatar technology is something that's we are really, really excited about and making again sort of big leaps and bounds over the last year. Um, and we're having a lot of fun with that, sort of recreating avatars for everybody that will use the platform. Um, and then, of course, the landscape of the art world has completely changed. So everyone now, when they go and look at artworks, the majority of people, don't shoot me if I'm wrong, but um, are looking at the works on Instagram now. So every time I'm having a conversation with a collector or an artist, it's always about a work that they've seen on Instagram, which is sort of a little bit sad um, that that's the way that people are looking at artworks now. So I wanted to try and build this community in a place which is actually a really nice and a really special place to, to view art. And on the 19th of November, we're launching um, a comment section, which is a starting point of our social side on web and mobile, but that will form also areas that forums and other areas in the next year or so that I really want the Vortic platform to, to be like a community and, and there should be like a, a really feeling of community, which will really come as well from the launch of the VR headsets. Um, one more thing to, to note uh, that we're just on the launch, uh, the verge of as well is the launch of the collector platform. Um, so collectors are able to come in, they can use the platform to, first of all, create their own space um, that they'd like to spend time with their collection, but they can also have huge amounts of, you know, pleasure from just spending time with their with their collection all in one place. I speak with so many collectors who their collections are all in storage everywhere. They don't have much space to show it. And they miss artworks. And I think this is a great tool to be able to spend time with your collection. But not only that, you, you really can start to recontextualize artworks, hanging them in different ways, looking at them together side by side with no physical constraints. Um, really sort of identify gaps in your collection that you may have missed by, you know, not being able to view it in, in this particular way. So, um, yeah, moving on to the, the, the future um, and the social function and the traversing of time and boundaries and being able to view artworks all in a place will really, for me, hopefully lead to a reduction in the amounts of shipping that we as galleries and the rest of the art world need to undertake in order to keep this industry going. Um, not sure about how we're doing for time, but I, um, I'd love to pass over to the, to the floor um, for, for questions. Um, there's a lot that I'd, more that I'd love to talk about, um, especially experiences. And I think everyone who thinks of VR thinks of these incredible experiences. I know, for example, you go to, um, you know, the Alice in Wonderland exhibition at the V&A and everyone comes out talking about the, this incredible um, experience of falling down the rabbit hole. And um, I mean, for me, we're working on experiences as well with artists um and digital artwork so there's a lot there's a huge amount to talk about which i couldn't cover off in 40 45 minutes yeah amazing thank you so much oliver and um, it's really lovely to actually hear more of your personal story and actually dig deeper into how and why you were actually so inspired to create this platform in the first place it's really fascinating so we have about 15 minutes left so if everyone could continue to put their questions into the chat i will get to as many of them as possible but to kick off I wondered what for you Oliver has been the most exciting use of the platform since you launched? So I think it's very difficult to say that there's been one use that I'm particularly excited about because I've seen the great thing about creating this technology is to see how people will use it you know so what we're doing is we've created a, a, a software which can be used in so many different ways but we can give that to everybody and see, you know, how it is used. I think that's one of the beauties of, of creating this because you're creating a tool for the whole industry to be able to use. For me, I mean, it's been 
being able to continue to make exhibitions throughout the whole pandemic when the gallery was closed, but we were still hanging exhibitions virtually. We were still talking to artists. We were still saying, let's do exhibitions together. And they were like, no, we can't because the gallery is closed and there's no physical way to it. And I'm like, no, there is a way to do it. And I showed them the technology and we've just had the most incredible time of creating exhibitions and artists that I had never expected to um, react to the technology and really enjoy the technology. Um, have loved it and asked to do more and more exhibitions. Um, so I think with um, Celia Paul, we've done three exhibitions now of her work during lockdown, showing lockdown works in Venice. It's just been, that, that for me has been, in the beginning of the journey, probably one of the, the greatest uses of the platform. Yeah, definitely. We found that in the research forum as well, the, act, the ability during lockdown and the pandemic to be able to support artists and just create this kind of community around it has been absolutely amazing. It's one of the best things about being in the digital world has been able to do that. Um, and that also kind of brings us on to my next question is, what do you think the next step in digital technologies will be for the art world? For example, do you think the digital has the potential to assist galleries and institutions in being more sustainable in their modeling? I think the sustainability is a, a huge factor that we're all thinking about right now, which is, it needs to be thought about. And we do need to act. Um, I think we're all like very aware of, you know, the situation with, you know, and, and we're seeing it more and more in the news, especially leading up to um, the next couple of weeks. But um, I think a lot needs to settle down in the next, over the next year or two after the pandemic. And I think digital should be really a way to complement the art that we show and exhibit. I don't think it should necessarily replicate um, or it should, shouldn't really, um, it shouldn't be either digital or physical. I think they really have to complement each other. And I think this is an incredible way to, um, to, to get across any boundaries that we might have in terms of travel or, you know, I think it, it should be a way of keeping art accessible for everybody globally, um, which I think is, to be honest, one of the beauties about the internet in hot, uh, as a whole. It's um, not just about this platform, but the access to, to data, to information and um, to, to culture is really, really important for everybody um, on the internet as a whole. So that needs to continue. People to continue having great experiences, looking online, looking at, at shows and really feeling that they're a part of it and can be a part of that community as well is really, really important for me. Yeah, and as someone, for me anyway, as someone that's grew up outside of London, it's actually really amazing to hear from people that aren't based here about how much they feel connected to the art world in London now because of the pandemic. So. That's yeah. one thing as well. Um, but before I get to our audience questions, because I see there's quite a lot already, I wanted to touch on the amazing collaboration between yourself and the Courtauld. Um, everyone at home, we are really thrilled to be using Vortic to produce virtual tours of our temporary exhibitions going forward. And I'm also excited to say that Oliver and his team have scanned the Great Room, which is the newly renovated home of our most loved works I'd say so are impressionists and post-impressionists and I was wondering Oliver if you wanted to explain a little bit quickly about this project. I mean it's a project that the Vortic team is it's really a dream for us to be working with such an incredible you know institution. Um, we have really over the last year worked out a, a way of scanning rooms without using com complex technology so this is all done using a SLR camera, you know, and it, it was all done in a day, you know, so I think scanning these spaces and it just gives, it will give everybody the use of the platform, but in an, in an environment which they can relate to. I think one of the biggest issues is with the Vorset platform in the last year is that everyone was using the same room to create exhibitions. And I really feel it's important to, have your own space and that feeling, it's really an identity. And you can see how important it is by the amount of work which has gone in in um, refurbishing the spaces. I, you came in and when we were scanning and I was just 
amazed in uh, the work and the detail that had gone into these spaces in restoring them. And for me, working with an institution which not only has an incredible collection, which is just going to be just a dream to see all of those works on the Borsic platform, but also working with the education side is so important for us and, and the future of Borsic. I really see this tool as something that can be used by students to be able to really start curating exhibitions. You know, it's, it's quite um, restricted in terms of who is allowed to curate an exhibition in some of these great spaces around the world. And now what I'd love to do is bring curating to everybody and allow everyone to have that experience. Because once you start curating exhibitions, you really start to understand the artworks and can contextualize the artworks in a completely different way that, that you can just by walking around and looking at how they've been hung for you. And that for me, working with the Courtauld is just so exciting because of the opportunities which it, it affords, you know, in, in, the, in the future and the way that we can work together. So yeah, thank you for putting your trust into the, the Vortic platform. It's a, it's a real dream for us to be working with you. Yeah, no, it's absolutely beautiful. And I'm sure it's going to be a fantastic asset that we go forward. And as you say, for teaching, curating course, actually being able to do something that's a little bit more visual um, and work with that will be absolutely fantastic. So we do have a lot of questions in the chat now. Um, Sarah is asking if you could say a little bit more about the process of working with artists and just explain a little bit more about that as well. Sure. So. Um... From the gallery side, so I have a dual role. So I am full time at Victoria Mirror Gallery, working very closely with the artists that we represent. So I represent, you know, I look after six artists very, very closely, and that relationship really involves every minor detail. So we go to their studio, we organise, you know, which works we'll be presenting, which works we'll be showing to collectors, which works um, will be get, you know, all of the museum loans. So everything always revolves back to digital um, because you're constantly working with these artists and, and then having follow-up conversations. So I go to the studio, I take images on my phone, I'm sending it back to the team in London, I'm sending it to curators that we're speaking to. And I can't tell you how many times I've sent images and people say, Oh, it's nothing how like how I'd imagined, you know, when it arrived. So really that is a process and working with them and showing them the technology as it grew, as it grew was a really fundamental part for us as a, a, as a building block, because we knew that if the artists were happy and their work was being translated properly, they would then be happy to show it on the platform. And so the whole growth of the, 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 the platform itself was, um, very much based on the relationship that we were having with artists and the feedback that we were getting from them. Yeah, that's really great. And I guess this kind of ties in as well to a few of the questions that have come in are around resistance to the platform. So is there any galleries that are, I guess, resistant to the competition this might cause against the physicality of visiting exhibitions in real life? But yeah, for me, it's it's different. It's a different experience and it's, yeah, but yeah, if you want to say anything about um, that. Definitely issues around um, competition and misunderstanding, or not, not misunderstandings, but, you know, for, from my perspective, I think everyone is very fixated on data and what data we may capture and we what conversations we, we could see. Now, the whole system is built to be completely independent. Any chat system that is used on the platform, we cannot see it. It's built, you know, encrypted as in a WhatsApp system is used. We're not, you know, the, the system is not built for data at all, so in to capture data. And that is backfired on us a little bit because we didn't build, when we built the system, any analytics into it. We didn't really want to know who was looking at it. We just wanted to do the best for the artist. Once a gallery started using it, they were like, look, we want to know um, all the analytics who's coming in to view. And we're like, well, we don't really capture that because we, we you know, I don't want to, you know, interfere with anyone's other, other business. This is really a, a platform to engage with your collector base. 
and it's a way to you know represent your artist in the best possible way um so we've started introducing very basic analytics to capture some of that data but we don't look at who's coming we just look at numbers that we can feed back to to galleries so they have an idea of the usage on on the platform so that's um yeah definitely resistance in terms of i, I just think it's a it's an evolution of, for sure um it, it will evolve in a way that people will understand and that you know we are using it in the best possible way for the galleries definitely and then we have a question from hannah who's saying thank you for your interesting insights on this discussion could you explain more or less exactly how the scanning process of the artworks takes place yeah okay so it started off by using very um sort of bespoke companies that were doing the scanning. So what they would do is if the artwork was a, a, a proper, uh, a small enough size, so up to about one meter 50, they would come in and they would, they have the turntable and they set up a camera and the camera takes, the, the turntable spins very, very slowly and the camera moves up and up and down and it takes hundreds and hundreds of pictures. And then there's a software that's used which stitches that together. So it's called photogrammetry and it stitches everything together and it creates a 3D model. And that has now evolved. And um, there, obviously, the, the camera, the equipment gets better and better. But the, some of this new technology that we are using doesn't require so much um, sort of heavy weight or heavy lifting. So there was a work in the Kusama show, for example, that we were able to scan from an iPad which is quite unbelievable um, thinking, but the, the, the LiDAR scanners to capture the geometry are just incredible. So at the moment, there's lots and lots of talk about how we can reduce some of that really, you know, heavyweight scanning process, which is, you know, a day of scanning, four or five days of post-process into a much more um, sort of a, a much more streamlined process because it is time consuming. And at that, it's, up until this point, it's been necessary, but um, we're getting to a point now where it's becoming easier and more affordable for everybody. Because it, it was so niche before, it was so specialized that the companies would charge a fortune for it. But there's more and more companies that we partner with that are coming into the market and able to scan, like do incredible quality scans and, very, and turn them around very, very quickly. That's great. And yeah, Hannah's also asking, how it is that you ensure that virtual exhibitions don't undermine physical exhibitions in that way as well in that process? So, I mean, the first, the first point there, um, how we don't undermine um, a physical exhibition is we make sure that it is, you know, reproduced as it is and to give you almost the same experience as you would do when walking into it. But, I think we're not trying to undermine any exhibition. What we're trying to do is open that exhibition to everybody who in the world that wants to see it and not the lucky few who might be in that location on that day or at that particular time. So I don't think we're ever going to, you know, um, try and say, okay, like the, the, the physical world shouldn't exist. Of course it should. And if, if you're lucky enough to be able to go into the museum, into the gallery and see the exhibition, then that is fantastic and you're never going to be able to beat that. But there are ways digitally that you may be able to enhance the experience. You may be able to go into the, the exhibition with the artist or do a tour with the artist or listen to audio guides that just wouldn't be available in a commercial gallery, although you would get them in, an audio, um, in, a, in a museum sometimes. Um, so there's lots and lots of building blocks that we can use to really enhance the digital experience, not try and really sort of, you know, undermine the experience of standing in front of an artwork. Um, you're never going to be able to beat that. However good technology gets, uh, that's always going to be the ultimate experience. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a really lovely note to end on, actually. There's a time and a place for both, and both are great and valid and useful in their own way. And actually, I think, Morta can the way it's going to expand is going to open up access to arts in a really beautiful way. So thank you very much for, for you, Oliver, for taking your time to talk to us, for everyone at home for joining us. And just to say this event has been recorded and will be on the Courtauld YouTube channel very soon. 
So don't worry if you missed anything. And um, I also wanted to thank Lawrence Seasale Associates Inc, a visual arts co advisory company for supporting this series and tonight's event. So please do stay in touch and check out everything else we have on at the portal and also at Vortec. Um, and I hope to see you all very soon. Thank you again and bye for now, everyone. Thank you very much.